Mas é com o cabo aí. Ah, mas se for internet, não faz. Ah. Só para ver se persistent of racism. Um, according to uh, many authors, according to the feelings of many authors in the literature on, on racism, the fight against racism is a bit like the fight of uh, uh, Hercules against uh, uh, Hydra, the monster from Greek mythology, where if Hercules cuts off uh, a head, uh, another one will appear. Uh, here's Achille Mbé, who was mentioned already earlier by, by others. He talks about uh, uh, Parisau, he has different metamorphoses, the best. And the uh, best is racism, which is talked about here. He also writes in the same book. Um, a raça não é só uma ficção útil, uma construção fantástica, uma projeção ideológica. Em muitos casos, ela é uma figura autônoma do real, cuja força e identidade se explicam pelo seu caráter extremamente mobil, inconstante e caprichoso. So that's a kind of dynamic uh, in race and racism. Here's another author uh, uh, whom uh, Cheo uh, had already discussed, Sally uh, Hasslinger. She writes, um, O sistema do fascismo é dinâmico, embora ele seja relativamente estável, possui um desenvolvimento histórico. Não sempre os ajustes voltam exatamente ao estado original, mas podem permitir uma transformação para um tipo diferente de estrutura hierárquica. Por exemplo, no caso dos afro-americanos, a escravatura se tornou segregação com Jim Crow, a qual se evoluiu para a hierarquia presente, mantido por intenção de massa e criminalização, Getizado, marginalizado, marginalização econômica e estigma cultural. So in a way, it seems that racism across history manages to uh, to survive, even though um, a lot changes in society and politics and history. And uh, this raises questions about how is this possible? This persistence. How can we make sense of it? And uh, what, uh, what kind of thing is racism that it has this ability to uh, to persist? Uh, what what uh, kind of uh, social ontology should we have of racism? So here it's a, it's a question about the metaphysics of racism itself, but the metaphysics of, of race, although the two are certainly connected. Uh, this kind of dynamics, how can we understand this in social ontological terms? Um, what kind of particular explanatory factors can be relevant in an uh, understanding of this persistence? Uh, social factors, uh, social uh, dynamics and causalities, but also psychological factors, perhaps, and uh, any other uh, things. And how can we uh, bring together such factors in a unified framework? And uh, then, uh, ultimately, the, the main purpose of this uh, of this whole inquiry: um, uh, how can we efficiently combat racism? Um, uh, an understanding of racism and its ability for for historical persistence, hopefully, will tell us also something about where are the points that we should attack in order to combat uh, racism. So these are big questions, obviously. I don't try to answer them all uh, tonight. And uh, the idea is rather to present you um, a work in progress and uh, a line of inquiry that I would like to uh, 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 to present you to person in the future in order to uh, a bit closer to answers to, to such questions. Um, before I present um, something about particular uh, possible answers to such questions, we should first uh, take into account how complex the phenomenon is. And we can do this by looking at some uh, prominent topics in uh, analysis of racism. There is uh, the, the most traditional understanding of uh, racism, where racism is a matter uh, of psychological attitudes of the individual, which are conscious attitudes. So a racist in this understanding is someone who has beliefs with uh, a content that discriminates people because of their race, or who has perhaps intentions and uh, affective states and uh, similar psychological states at this level uh, with, with racist contents. But then, uh, since uh, uh, the 
period after the Second World War, another um, uh, approach emerged, where other dimensions of racism um, were brought into view. And uh, here, uh, it's the phenomenon of, of structural racism, which also has already been mentioned and cited several times in, in this conference. Here, uh, one does not look at, uh, at least not primarily, at uh, psychological states of the individual, but at uh, uh, forms of discrimination in society, in uh, the institutions and practices of a society. And this uh, discrimination can uh, um, affect uh, a lot of different uh, dimensions in society. Uh, one crucial dimension is the distribution of goods, and here there are many relevant goods. Uh, wealth is, is uh, fundamental, of course. Um, distribution of wealth in society, uh, income, uh, uh, jobs, education, uh, so distribution of, of access to, to education, to health uh, system, um, legal status, um, in codified law, but also what legal status to pe people de facto enjoy in a, in a given society. Uh, uh, security, protection against violence, against private violence, but also police violence. Um, other uh, dimensions of discrimination which uh, uh, are relevant here is uh, language. So, for example, racial uh, slurs, which we share as well, and, uh, structures in language which, uh, which discriminate people. Uh, then uh, moral and aesthetic and other uh, uh, dimensions of our um, normal life and our valuations, uh, so for example, uh, an aesthetic normativity or normality which uh, presents white uh, color of skin as uh, aesthetically desirable. Um, then uh, institutions which can uh, uh, um, work in a discriminatory way or uh, um, uh, support and, and reduce discrimination. Here, uh, Althusser's term of the apparatus ideological, so the start of the ideological apparatus of the state is uh, helpful, I think. Uh, he uses it in a, in a Marxist uh, context, and uh, um, the idea is that there are several important institutions in a society where the, the ruling ideology of the society is uh, produced and, and taught to people, and these uh, institu uh, institutions include family, the school, the universities, the media, culture and so on. These are all places um, where both um, explicit racist contents can be produced and, and uh, taught to people, and then uh, also uh, ignorance. Uh, Charles Mills, an author that I will come back to later on, he talks about an epistemology of ignorance where um, discrimination is produced in a society uh, not because explicit racist contents are taught in the school, for example, or at universities. But because there is a culture of ignorance where uh, particular contents are not talked about and people don't learn about them. Finally, there's a, th a third big dimension which uh, is relevant here, uh, which uh, uh, has to do with, uh, again, uh, uh, psychological um, aspects of the individual. But now they are located not at a conscious level, but at an implicit or unconscious level. And here, um, one important um, phenomenon is so-called implicit bias, which has recently been discussed a lot in psychology and in some philosophical uh, circles. Um, in Portuguese, I think one can translate it as uh, could say to implicito. And the idea is that there are um, unconscious associations uh, which can produce uh, a behavior that is discriminating, racist, uh, but that the person is not aware of. Um, these associations have been discovered by tests like the so-called implicit association test, where uh, people uh, get a picture like this. I'm not sure if you can read this, but basically uh, you have a dark face, and then people have to choose between to choose between uh, categorizations. Uh, here, African American or bad. And here, European American or good, and uh, then uh, the, the time is measured that people take to, to respond. And here, uh, the, the right response is uh, uh, this one. Uh, but psychologists notice that if you get this combination, African American or bad, this is a transcription, people uh, tend to respond um, more quickly. 
that when you have the different combination, where you have, uh, for example, um, here good and, and here bad, uh, then people will normally try to take longer to, 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 to respond. And this shows, uh, according to psychologists, uh, that there are such discriminatory uh, associations that can be detected even if uh, even if people who at the conscious level are completely anti-racist and liberal. So people are often very surprised when they take this test. Uh, also, uh, this implicit bias has been uh, uh, detected uh, in members of the stigmatized groups. So in, in the, the previous example, black people also show a, a bias against uh, black people. Um, this uh, test, uh, or with the most prominent one, you can do this yourself on the internet. And I very much recommend it, because it can be an interesting experience to, to learn something of its own um, unconscious associations. And there's, uh, as I said, a growing literature, an entry in the Central Encyclopedia, which is very good, and a two-volume uh, set on uh, philosophy and implicit bias. And it's an, an ongoing discussion. So you have this implicit bias, and then microaggression is a further uh, uh, useful term here. Um, um, speech acts which uh, are discriminatory but in an uh, implicit uh, way. Because uh, uh, they, they, for example, uh, in Germany it's very, it happens very often that uh, a black German um, is asked, but where do you come from? Where do you really come from? Even if the person is born in Germany. And uh, this question is not explicitly racist perhaps, but it presupposes an assumption uh, on which uh, it's very unlikely that the person is, is really German, and uh, so there, there's a dis discriminatory, discriminatory assumption in the background. And so this can be seen as another element uh, of such an implicit individual uh, racism. So we get um, various dimensions, as I said. This is now all together. And in the debate, uh, or various debates on such topics, there's a tendency to focus on just one of these dimensions. For example, psychologists nowadays look at this and look at the social thing. So the constructivists and post-structuralists, they look at this and uh, think that racism is primarily this and uh, bracket uh, facts about individual psychology. Um, I think um, a plausible account should bring together these different dimensions and integrate the empirical work from different uh, fields in an understanding of racism that, uh, that is open for, for these various dimensions and uh, understands how they hang together and uh, connect to each other. And I think this is directly relevant to the question of the persistence of racism. So the question is now more specifically if we see this as a whole system with parts that uh, mutually support each other, I will say more about this later on. Uh, how is it that this whole uh, this whole system uh, survives? There are uh, different approaches um, which one can take here, and with one approach uh, which groups together several uh, several different theories has to do with uh, the idea of a human nature, where one has something like stable uh, uh, stable features of human beings, uh, which explain. Uh, racism in these various dimensions. Um, so the idea would be human being, beings as such, because of their uh, psychological or anthropological nature, have a tendency to racism. Um, and uh, this is just what it explains, that explains that there is racism. So uh, you can find this, for example, in uh, um, uh, existentialists like Michael uh, Bouvard in an anthropological version. Also, in Castellanos, there is a very interesting article on, on uh, racism. Here, the idea would be that uh, man tends to define uh, himself or herself against another. Um, and this, this basic tendency of human beings uh, explains why there is racism. But there are other different variations of this topic. So it started with uh, his uh, um, idea that racism is very fate. Um, the assumption that people have generally a fear of otherness, and therefore many um, existential scholar uses the term heterophobia uh, for, for this phenomenon to group together racism with sexism and other forms of discrimination. But then there are also psychological versions of a very similar idea, where the idea is that people have an, an, an inbuilt mechanism 
um, that was selected a lot of time ago in, in evolution, and which allows them to, uh, to detect uh, the social structure of their society. So basically, they understand what is their group and how is the group uh, uh, separated or, or um, uh, distinguished from, from, from people outside the group. And uh, this mechanism on, this, on these views um, um, uh, fixes such differences. It uh, makes them, uh, it essentializes them, it biologizes them, it moralizes them. So there are very psychological, psychological data that suggests that early, early childhood already uh, children uh, tend to essentialize uh, and biologize um, differences in, in skin color, for example. I think this is all very interesting, but there are some, some problems with this. And just very briefly, um, one problem is that these accounts all, they don't uh, assume a tendency specifically for racism, but only for somehow opposing oneself to otherness, basically, to, to uh, separating oneself from uh, other groups. And that this takes the form of racism presupposes that the social uh, um, order um, the structure of the different groups is already one that is defined in terms of, uh, of race. So it, it presupposes a, a racial society, and uh, so it kind of stands alone as an explanation. In addition, um, if people really have these tendencies, then we should expect that the different groups in society, uh, especially different racial groups, uh, develop uh, such feelings of fear, of opposition, or whatever towards each other. It's not so clear that this really stabilizes the, the whole system, and that this can explain the, the stability and persistence of racism. And then there's the problem uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, so this is actually another, uh, uh, yeah, this, this problem of, of symmetry, basically. Um, it's not so clear that, uh, that you have, uh, that the stigmatized persons also have these uh, uh, feelings of fear and opposition and so on to, to, to the others. Uh, in the implicit association test, as I said, you find that the black people have, have uh, anti-black bias, and so it's not that they uh, uh, define themselves by opposing themselves to, to white, or so they, they somehow share the racist but at this unconscious level. They seem to share the, the racist uh, attitudes of, uh, of whites, and, and this this whole approach um, um, is difficult to make sense of this. A second uh, approach. Uh, which is very important is uh, Charles Mills, who was also already cited by Moschiello. Uh, he has a, a book, The Racial Contact, which I very much recommend. It's a brilliant book, I think. Um, he, his main idea is that uh, there is um, a social contract, so in analogy with the, the social the tradition of contractualism, uh, a social contract between whites um, to exclude uh, everyone who is not white from humanity, to treat them as subhumans. And the reason why whites uh, enter this contract uh, is um, uh, European conquest and, and colonialism. So uh, here's a passage where it says that there is the principle, uh, the, 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 the purpose of this contract is un privilegio diferencial dos francos como grupo sobre los no francos como grupo exploración los cuerpos la tierra y los recursos genéticos y unidad oportunidades socioeconómicas y wise colonialism. Uh, that's why why whites uh, enter this contract. And this also comes with the epistemology of ignorance, which uncovers this uh, uh, this racial uh, or racist uh, society, which results from the assumption that uh, non-white people are not uh, really human people. And one important feature about this this uh, whole model is that uh, there's a kind of teleological structure. There are different elements of this contract, uh, like this epistemology of ignorance, that the contract is designed such as to protect the economic interests of white in the colonial and post-colonial. Uh, situation. Okay, you have this kind of teleology, and if there's really such a thing like the racial contract, then this teleology could nicely explain the stability because the various parts of the contract they all perform a function, and uh, uh, this all contributes to um, to stabilizing white privilege and uh, stabilizing the, the racist order. 
However, I think um, a problem here is what is exactly the social ontological status of this contract. Mills uh, talks about uh, a historical reality of this contract. It's not just uh, a theoretical fiction like in the contractarian uh, 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 tradition. It's uh, something that people really uh, enter into as a contract. Uh, that has an explanatory power. Um, Says it's uh, claramente, historicamente, localizable in a serie of eventos marcando aquí a Sao do Mundo Moderno, pero colonialismo europeo, para las viadas, los descontinentes. But um, what, what kind of reality is it that the social con the racial contract has according to Humilis? Especially these uh, teleological uh, structures. What, um, much of what he says suggests that, that people uh, intentionally. Uh, decide to enter this contract, at least many whites, and this is perhaps plausible for uh, for the early phase of colonization, um, where discourses uh, on on, uh, on race, um, on Mill's interpretation, were developed with the explicit intention to um, um, to defend and justify colonization and, and slavery and so on. Uh, but uh, later on, and also nowadays, it's perhaps not so clear that people somehow consciously decide to to join the contract because it's good for their economic interests. I think it's rather that people are born into this world and, and racism is already there, that they become a part of it. It was not really an intentional decision. And then there are these unconscious elements that I was talking about, like implicit bias. If something is unconscious, then uh, it's not so plausible that people can consciously decide to enter the racial contract and adopt these uh, features. So I think there are basically some ontological problems about the status of this social contract as an, as an explanatory tool. Here's finally another approach, which I, uh, is the one that, I, uh, that seems most promising to me and that I would like to build on. How much time do I have? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes. So uh, this is uh, Sally Hasslinger. Uh, again, uh, who uses the concept of uh, homostasis uh, in uh, the context of precisely our question? Okay, explica la desigualdad o injusticia racial existente. I will read this a bit more slowly now, perhaps because uh, this, this quotation is, I think, very rich, and I will try to, to build on this. Não acho que a resposta melhor é simplesmente a ideologia. São as práticas que distribuem as coisas de valor e desvalor. Os resíduos tóxicos são descarizados nos bairros pobres e as escolas boas são construídas nos subúrbios brancos. Naturalmente, estas práticas não são arbitrárias, não têm surpresa acerca de onde vão as coisas boas. Mas a distribuição dos bens Não é assim por aquilo que a maior parte da gente acredita, porque é verdade também que os indivíduos compartilham as crenças racistas porque vivem num mundo no qual certos grupos recebem as coisas boas. Nós aprendemos sobre a raça e sobre o que as raças diferentes merecem, olhando em volta de nós mesmos. Isso sugere que a desigualdade racial é um fenômeno sistemático que se compreende melhor em termos de homeostase dinâmica. So she basically uh, works with a distinction here between ideology, uh, which is uh, correspond, I think, roughly to, uh, to the psychological uh, uh, elements that I had mentioned before, explicit uh, racist theories and beliefs, but also unconscious. Um, uh, associations, for example, and on the other hand, social structure, right? Structural racism, uh, unequal distribution of goods, uh, for example. And uh, she argues that there's a, a connection between both that goes in both directions. And is, especially people have racist uh, attitudes because they, they look around themselves and find an, an unequal people world where uh, uh, um, some races get less than uh, treated worse than, than others. And this is something that uh, supports these, uh, these racist attitudes, just 
she thinks. Um, there's a lot of question, I think, about these interconnections, and I will talk about this. But um, first of all, this term of homeostasis that she introduces here, yeah, dynamic homeostasis. Uh, this is basically an ontological model in order to make sense of this whole structure that you, she describes here. And especially in order to make sense of the kind of persistence that this structure has across time. Its ability to, to resist across change, basically. And uh, she's building on here uh, the work of uh, um, a philosopher of science and metaphysician, Richard Boyd who uh, initially discusses uh, a problem that also I keep referring to your, to your uh, presentation because there are, there are lots of uh, uh, interesting connections here, I think. Um, you explained the problems about, about natural kinds versus uh, social kinds. Um, and uh, this Richard Boyd uh, had made a proposal for how to understand uh, natural kinds uh, like biological kinds, for example, a way that can deal with the problem that uh, there are uh, um, blurred boundaries between the, the kinds, uh, problems that uh, um, it's often difficult to, to find exactly the, the boundary and uh, nature does not seem so, so clear cut and systematic. He uh, has a, a view of natural kinds um, and objective kinds in general, uh, where you uh, understand these kinds of uh, homeostatic property clusters. Uh, clusters homeostaticus to probably largest. So uh, the idea is that there's not a set of conditions which are uh, individually necessary and jointly sufficient for membership in the kind, but it, it can be a bit more chaotic than that and blurry. There's a group of uh, properties and um, if something possesses most of these properties, a certain subset of them, it can belong to the Ducard when the Ducard would go best as a, a spot on, uh, on his feathers uh, or in the sense that there are some black feathers here and they have this missing some, some part of this body. But it's, uh, it's still a way of, of the kind, but basically a more, a more flexible understanding of such kinds. And uh, Boyd explains these uh, uh, homostatic property clusters, so what makes them homostatic, um, by saying that um, in such an objective kind, you have these different properties that are connected together by causal mechanisms. So there are causal mechanisms such that uh, the various properties support each other, or the instances of the properties support each other. So the biological case, there's uh, the whole system of DNA, for example, uh, which is one very complex causal mechanism that uh, tends to produce, so a given set of DNA tends to produce a particular phenotype, the structure of the organism, and so on. Then there are processes of reproduction, which also make it the case that the children of the Tukhan will look like black like and so on. And uh, the ecological niche may also play some role. So there are various factors with, which make it mm, likely that the properties that are combined in this, in this uh, animal uh, tend to occur together, okay? That there, that there are animals with, this, uh, with these features. Uh, so these causal mechanisms are very important. Uh, they support this, uh, this set of properties, connected causes. And in, if this is the case, you will get a structure um, that is uh, stabilized in a way. So the causal mechanisms uh, that are specific for, for this organism uh, stabilize the organism across time. So the different properties of the Tukhan are not only uh, instantiated right now together. In five minutes, they will still be instantiated together, and uh, also in a year and so on. Because there are these causal mechanisms that make it the case that there's a stable combination of these properties. And I think this is an, so Haslinger wants to apply this model to the, uh, to the issues of, of racism. The idea would be there you have also a lot of different properties, these different elements and dimensions of racism, and uh, there's also here some kind of connection that holds them together. And I think if one has such an account, then one can see 
it's an approach that is interesting, I think, because it allows to, to, to integrate uh, different elements and different dimensions of, of uh, uh, races and explanatory factors. But then the main question becomes, uh, if one takes this approach, what, uh, um, what are these causal mechanisms? So I was uh, suggesting that you have these different factors here. These, uh, in a given society, are all particular properties or accentuations of properties. Um, racism as a homostatic property cluster would be uh, such a whole cluster of properties. And then you need these causal mechanisms that explain why these properties occur together. And uh, hence, you need causal mechanisms that connect these features. And in order to understand the stability and the persistence of racism, one has to understand uh, what, what mechanisms hold these, uh, these elements together. Uh, and some of what, what uh, Hasslinger uh, uh, writes addresses this question, but I think there's a lot more work to do here and a lot more discussion needed about the relevant uh, mechanisms. And uh, in the remaining time, I'll try to say just a little bit on, on some relevant uh, connections here between these dimensions. So, uh, as a matter of principle, I think one can distinguish here uh, the following. You have here uh, factors about the individual, and here factors about society. And so you can uh, look at mechanisms that connect the different psychological features of the individual with each other. You can look at mechanisms that connect the different social features with each other. And then you can look at uh, causal mechanisms where the causality goes from uh, psychological features of the individual to society, or does the society, or does the individual and its psychology affect social reality? And you can look at connections that go the other way. Uh, how does society affect the individual and its uh, Where's this elements? If you look at uh, mechanisms inside the individual, I think it's very straightforward. So. It's likely that there's some causal connection between the implicit and the explicit attitudes. Uh, for example, implicit bias makes it perhaps more likely that people have explicit racist beliefs or open for them. Um, that there's a connection between uh, uh, actions and uh, decisions here and, and beliefs and so on. This is it's just very standard psychological causal mechanisms. If you look at the mechanisms inside the social realm, it becomes a bit more uh, challenging and uh, makes more interesting. Um, here's just two examples for, for relevant kinds of mechanisms. Uh, one has to do with the conditions for distributions of, uh, of uh, goods in a given society. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you take a society where access to good education, access to a good health system, depends on, uh, on wealth. You have to be rich in order to get uh, good schools for your, for your, for your child and good, uh, good health system. Uh, then you will have a causal mechanism such that uh, you get a connection here. So if someone, has, if someone is disadvantaged in terms of wealth, this will cause a, a disadvantage in terms of uh, education and uh, health and uh, de facto legal status and so on so and so on. Um, uh, so discrimination in one respect will cause discrimination in other respects because of these uh, conditions of access. Uh, sorry, these are conditions of, of distribution in society. Another relevant thing is the conditions of access to leading positions in these uh, ideological state apparatus. Um, like, um, what does it take for a person from a particular group to become, uh, uh, to, to get an important role in, uh, in a, an important media outlet, or get an important role in, uh, in the school system and the education system, the Ministry of Education, perhaps, and thus uh, influence, uh, influence uh, these institutions. Um, in a racialized society, there's a tendency, I think, that uh, access to exactly such positions is very much much restricted, and it's especially hard for for people uh, from from uh, the racially uh, discriminated groups to get access to, to such key positions. Uh, and uh, 
uh, this will also get you a causal mechanism. A causal mechanism, because then, for example, you can explain why um, why we have discrimination uh, in in these institutions, right? Uh, why do they transport uh, racist ideology or and, uh, and epistemology of ignorance? Uh, because they have conditions of access to the to key positions in, in these institutions, which exclude members of uh, um, uh, discriminated groups, especially if, for example, if, if it takes uh, good education to, to get such a position, uh, which it likely does, and education depends on uh, on wealth, and uh, black people in a given country tend to be uh, tend to be poor because uh, uh, they are discriminated. So this this gets you further connections here with this uh, social structure. And then I said uh, the causal interactions between individual and society. If one looks at um, the impact that individuals have on social reality, I think one uh, interesting case here are uh, what one could call Pontus di Jung Sao, points of juncture, where the uh, attitudes of an individual have a particularly strong impact on social reality. So, of course, what we do always in uh, expresses our attitudes and has some impact on society. But there are cases where there's a, where there's, the situation is such that uh, the actions of the individual that express the attitudes of the individual can make a huge uh, impact on social reality. Um, if you take, for example, decisions that have to do with, uh, uh, with hiring people, so for example, uh, em employers, when they when they screen the CVs uh, for uh, for a job, um, then uh, you can regularly uh, uh, detect a bias with uh, people uh, that have a name that sounds uh, uh, as if the, the person were a member of a stigmatized group. Uh, the, the, in that case, it will be much more uh, it will be much less likely that the employer invites the, the candidate to do a job interview. Okay, just because uh, of, of, of the group membership. And uh, this uh, is probably, in many cases, something that happens unconsciously. It happens also with people, with employers, who, who are not uh, consciously racist or so. It has to do most probably with implicit bias, automatic reactions, uh, uh, automatic associations. And of course, in that case, the decision makes a huge difference to the life of, uh, of the candidate for the job. And if that happens regularly, you will get a situation where you get a discrimination on the job market as a consequence of uh, implicit bias. Uh, so here, the, the attitudes of the individual very strongly influence uh, and produce uh, discrimination as a phenomenon of structural racism. A political vote is an obvious candidate as well. Um, decisions that have to do with housing market. Uh, where do rich people buy their houses? Things like that. Who uh, can who can get who can buy uh, a house? Um, in, in that case, implicit bias can, can produce uh, discrimination and segregation and whatever on the shop market. Then also decisions that have to do with law. Uh, if someone is in a judge, then implicit bias will have a particularly uh, bad effect on, on social reality. Uh, and similar things, decisions that by by bankers uh, about whom to give a credit, uh, decision about important administrative issues, and so on. So here we have these these key uh, points, uh, I would say points of juncture between uh, the individual and its attitudes and actions and, uh, and social structure. And this gives you uh, a causal mechanism that connects these, this connects uh, the individual and. and Structural racism. And then, if you take the other direction, uh, how does society affect the individual? Uh, then one will have to talk about social learning. And uh, Hasminger, in the quote uh, earlier, says something about that. She says people look around themselves and find that, uh, for example, black people are disadvantaged, and then they think uh, this is normal and this is okay. I think one has to develop this a bit further and uh, find out more about the mechanisms of social learning that make it the case that uh, society with uh, uh, racist structures will give you individuals that have racist attitudes. Um, 
uh, but uh, perhaps it's not necessary not to go into details here. That's probably that's also a little time left. So I just uh, um, conclude with uh, um, some some brief comments and open questions uh, uh, for me here. Um, one uh, uh, thing that one could uh, remark about the mechanisms that I was talking about is that they are uh, all very general uh, mechanisms, psychological and, so and social mechanisms. It's not mechanisms that have to do something specifically with with uh, racism or even something with an attitude of uh, opposing oneself to the other also, as in, in the existentialist accounts, for example. Uh, it's very general mechanisms on this account that, that hold uh, uh, things together in this system of racism and what what makes it the case that these very generic mechanisms uh, produce and maintain racism is uh, that uh, there was a historical situation where society was uh, uh, turned into a racist society um, in connection with uh, what uh, Mills was talking about uh, European expansion and conquest and, and uh, colonization and, and uh, slave trade um, this makes it the case that uh, I think uh, so. Uh, if one takes this situation plus these generic social mechanisms and psychological mechanisms, uh, these mechanisms will make it the case that uh, this kind of uh, situation, the racist society that was created back then, um, persists. So we are basically caught in a trap, um, not because there are racist instincts in us or so, but because uh, generic mechanisms that make things stable in our society uh, are applied uh, to um, to a society that, is, that has become racist for these historical reasons. Uh, one can ask, or one important further question would be here, uh, are there factors that are more important, more fundamental explanatorily in this whole system than others? Uh, so for example, one candidate is wealth. Um, especially since, since wealth is uh, inherited. Uh, or if someone is, is rich, then the children also will be rich. Um, with uh, education and job market and so on, if someone is, is, is very active and so on, it's more possible for the individual to, to get a better position, even if the individual starts from a, a disadvantaged position. But with, with wealth, uh, it's, it's, it seems to be uh, more uh, basic, perhaps, more, um, more persistent, uh, an argument like equal distribution. And uh, so, uh, if, if wealth plays a, a particularly strong fundamental uh, role in this whole system, then perhaps um, uh, it's possible to argue that one that we will never get out of uh, uh, the system of racism unless uh, wealth is completely uh, redistributed and, for example, reparation payings uh, to the victims of, of the slave trade become relevant here. As a mean, means which is perhaps necessary to, to really combat racism. Um, then, um, uh, further practical consequences uh, from this model or this, this framework with regard to anti racist action. I think one interesting uh, consequence here from seeing things this way is that uh, it's not enough to, uh, to fight against these racist, racist elements in the system, but one uh, should also do something against the causal connections between them. So for example, uh, uh, reduce or eliminate the cases where uh, individual attitudes have such a big impact on society. Uh, formalize decisions where uh, creating more rules uh, and make uh, uh, job applications uh, anonymous and things like that become relevant here in, in order to, to reduce the effect that implicit bias has on, um, on social discrimination. And then of course also something like uh, make, make it the case that wealth is not a necessary uh, condition for accessing a uh, health system and education and so on. I mean, these are obviously uh, things that, have, uh, that are topic and have been implemented in some countries in the connection of social justice. But here, I think there's a framework that I presented makes makes it possible to connect them directly to, to the issue of, um, of, of the, the stability and persistence of racism. And finally, one uh, last point that I would like to make is uh, in this framework, it's possible to argue that a policy of color blindness, where race is just uh, ignored, 
um, does not help, most probably, because it affects only uh, uh, the, the explicit attitudes of people and not their implicit bias. So if, uh, if for example, parents and, uh, and uh, teachers never talk about racial questions uh, with their children because they think one should uh, completely ignore the issue in order not to make people, in order not to make children racist. Um, the existence of implicit bias and data about implicit bias suggests very strongly that this is uh, not a good uh, idea because uh, then in the absence of uh, information from their parents, uh, the children will, um, again, through social learning, look around themselves and find an unequal system and think that this is normal. And in this way, uh, the implicit bias will be created and strengthened. So the idea would be that uh, uh, these things should be, should be uh, made a topic and it should be expanded to, to children that they can be racist. Yeah, let me stop with that and then we forward to the discussion. Thanks. Can, can I ask in, in, in uh, can I respond in English and so I think there are many different factors which which can play a role here. But um uh, Charles Mills um, in his work on the racial contract. Uh, he argues that this, these ideas came into the world in order to justify colonialism and, and uh, European conquest and so on. Uh, it was an, an, a theory and ideology which, which was created uh, in order to, uh, to defend this kind of system and this exploitation. And then uh, it got a life of its own and was turned into scientific theories and so on and taught at, at universities. Um, so as one can say, on, on one interpretation, one explanation, uh, originally there are particular economic, uh, historical reasons for developing these ideas. Um, and then these ideas um, um, a tradition is created in which these ideas are taught to, uh, to other generations. Uh, I think this is one, one aspect. But then there are certainly also more because one can also observe that uh, so more more um, uh, aspects to the question because one can also observe that uh, these explicit ideas uh, I think in some countries had, had been uh, had declined in the last decades and now they are coming back so there must also be some explanation for this but um, I don't have a full story about it. It's definitely an important question. Sim, eu vou, vou resumir um pouco. Tá? É, ele disse que é, ele acha que tem vários fatores. Tá? É, ele citou é, o Mills, segundo o qual essas ideias assim, explícitas nasceram para justificar o projeto colonial e o projeto de dominação. Certo? Porque depois, o que aconteceu? Essas teorias, elas como se é, adquiriram uma vida própria, começaram a, a se transformar em teoria científica, começaram a ser ensinadas nas universidades, a circular e aí vai. Né? Mas ele disse que isso é um, uma explicação possível, mas é, ele tem a sensação que deve ter outras explicações, porque é, se você vê é, a circulação desses discursos racistas explícitos, você vê que, tipo, anos atrás, teve uma queda 
e agora recentemente surgiu um de novo. Aí tem que ter alguma explicação disso, a gente não sabe, assim, não sabe dizer qual é, mas pelo menos é notável o fato de que eles, esses discursos é, sofrem é, alterações na circulação. Né? Ele tem uma, e às vezes são muito rápidos. Né? Ele tem uma explicação diferente dessa mais uma coisa mais simplesmente se se tem uh, uh, este racismo estrutural simplesmente ajuda uh, faz ou faz mais provável que a gente tem, uh, esta a, 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 Eu não mas eu vou ficar no final. Não, faz, faz, Vá, pode continuar, depois eu vou ler. Você falou sobre as crianças, né? E pra, eu entendi muito esse esquema do racismo assim, estrutural, está sempre é, interligado com o individual explícito e o individual implícito. Mas é, eu penso que uma das explicações, posso estar redonda minha opinião, eu penso que uma das explicações para existir esse racismo explícito é por causa de alguma coisa psicológica, algum, algum trauma psicológico. Ah. E um exemplo que, por exemplo, a gente cria as crianças num racismo estrutural porque fomos criados dessa forma. Mas, em indivíduos que já têm o, o conhecimento de que racismo é uma coisa ruim e cria as crianças com essa ideia, é, eles vão nas, nas escolas, eles veem o racismo estrutural. É, é mesmo que você vendo uma família que entende que racismo é ruim, você vai acabar tendo características racistas por causa do racismo estrutural. É, mas eu vou dar um exemplo de uma criança que eu conheço, que a família dele é branca, mas ele sofreu um ataque muito grande, tipo, ele sofreu um ataque grande na visão de uma criança por uma menina na escola que é negra. Então, desde isso, desde esse trauma psicológico, ele começou a criar uma certa aversão a negro. E na casa dele tem um quadro, um cavalo branco e um cavalo negro brigando, e ele não gosta de nada do negro, sempre tem esse ideia de black is bad and white is good. Sempre essa espécie por causa de traumas sociais. Porque, para mim, é uma pessoa muito tapada para ser racista sem ser por ignorância ou por racismo estrutural. Eu não entendi a última. Não, 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 não. Posso, posso. Então, as idiot people think uh, the racism estrutural is. Deixa eu voltar. <risos> I think the people who are creating in uh, a smooth control and be racist is okay because it's the creation. That's the Eu posso. Eu posso. <risos> Deixa eu voltar. Deixa eu voltar. O inglês não é nada bom. I think the people was assista with some other people. Yeah. It's, it's because exist the racismo estrutural. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. But I think it, uh, people was have, uh, doing this uh, conscientemente. Oh. It's a dumb people. It's a ego. Because yeah, he knows yeah. what was happening. Concordo. Mas, um, uh, talvez, talvez uh, uma coisa que, que eu uh, acho é que um, a ideia não, não, não é que, que todos os elementos sempre uh, existem juntos. Uh, que todos são, são necessários. Uh, o boy diz que, uh, que, que é um, um, 
cluster uh, precisa uh, o racismo precisa de muitos elementos mas uh, existe também uma, um racismo uma sociedade racista que não onde não tem talvez uh, um, é, é possível uma sociedade racista onde uh, ninguém uh, tem uh, estas uh, atitudes. Uh, o, uh, uma sociedade o, são muito poucos que, que têm uh, estas atitudes. Né? Uh, todavia, uh, pode ser uma sociedade onde uh, tem uh, o racismo individual de sítio e o racismo estrutural. Um, tem um, um livro uh, que se chama uh, Racism Without Racists. Um, uh, a ideia é que se uh, fala sobretudo uh, acho, sobre o racismo estrutural, uh, não, não fala sobre a, sobre a psicologia. Mas uh, a, a ideia é, uh, não é suficiente. Um, educar as crianças uh, uh, ao nível uh, uh, das teorias, das, das atitudes, atitudes uh, explícitas. Um, precisa também, uh, precisa também uh, mudar toda essa estrutura. Fernando, vou perguntar por Deus. Interesting room. Three. So I have two questions. Okay. Uh, primeira, você poderia, por favor, botar ah, os primeiros slides aí, vou colocar, eu quero acho. É na escrita no argumento que você usou para explicar essa estrutura no início. Uh, Peraí. É o mais legal, vai pode voltando. Acho que pode ir voltando. Não, você, você me perguntou, desculpa. Eu sei. Uh, deixa eu ver se eu acho. Uh, não, não sei. Uh, 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 agora, mas a ideia era é, mais ou menos assim, é, nessa estrutura, se você, se você tem é, o racismo individual explícito e implícito, é, eu tinha entendido que eles tinham uma, é, o argumento era mais ou menos assim, você tem é, a racismo individual implícito e explícito porque você tem o estrutural, foi na primeira parte da sua explicação, né? Mas agora eu não estou seguro, porque eu não estou encontrando o argumento. Tá? Então a minha pergunta ia ser, se fosse isso, né? depois você... É isso, mas não, não adianta. Uh, uh, é assim. Você, there is uh, implicit and, and ex, uh, explicit racism, oh. because there is a structural racism. Ok? It goes also in the other direction, I think. Hmm. Tá, é isso que eu tinha entendido, porque você fala, uh, uh, o que eu tinha entendido é que você tem o um implícito e o um explícito, porque você tem o um estrutural. Não é? O estrutural. Uh, uh, não, é. Uh, 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 é uma, uma é, causalidade. Sim. Um, 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 um sistema que, que consiste de elementos, elementos diferentes que. Uh, não há primazia de um sobre o outro, você quer dizer que é isso? Não, uh, não mas uh, talvez tem alguns elementos que são particularmente importantes, que, que, que ah, tem um, um uh, estatuto causal particularmente uh, okay. fundamental. Okay, tá. Uh, uh, tá. A outra questão é a seguinte. 
Uh, lembra da distinção do APA entre racismo extrínseco e, e intrínseco? Uhum. Então, a, o extrínseco diz que você tem certas propriedades essenciais da raça que implicam o comportamento dos indivíduos. Uhum. Né? Uh, e uh, isso é interessante, ele vai dizer que o sujeito que sustenta uh, esse tipo de crença, uhum. né? ele tem uh, um déficit cognitivo que não há nada, na verdade, de propriedade essencial hum. que cause, hum. né, que determine os hum. comportamentos hum. Uh, dessa pessoa. Hum. Então, eu não sou vagabundo, hum. porque eu sou negro. Hum. Né? Então, esse, a pessoa que sustenta essas, essas, essas crenças, ela tem hum. uma deficiência cognitiva. Agora, no que diz respeito ao racismo intrínseco, né, que é a ideia de que as raças diferem entre si porque elas têm propriedades uhum. que as diferem, é, é, o que ele vai extrair disso é que o sujeito que sustenta essas crenças ele tem um erro moral, não um déficit uhum. é, cognitivo, mas uma deficiência moral porque um, um problema moral, né? ele tem um uhum. problema de uma deficiência moral porque porque não há nada que justifique tratar uma pessoa diferentemente da outra uhum. por causa da sua raça. Uhum. Mas por causa de... Se você vai tratar alguém de maneira diferente, é porque essa pessoa tem propriedades morais relevantes, significativas, uhum. que justificam esse tratamento, não por causa das propriedades da raça dela. Uhum. Okay? Então, uh, nesse esquema que você uhum. monta, uh, expôs, Uh, esses dois tipos de racismo do APA, o uhum. intrínseco e estrito, entrariam exclusivamente naquela dimensão do individual uh, explícito? Você concordaria com isso? No racismo individual explícito, você acha que daria para uh, incluir esses dois, essa caracterização de racismo no explícito? A Não caracterização do, do, do APA? Não? É, é difícil também porque o não, a psicologia não, não tem ainda muita, muitos dados uh, sobre, uh, uhum. sobre tudo, só sobre, sobre uh, os conteúdos uh, uh, desses preconceitos. Uhum. É, isso seria importante. Tá. Mas é, vamos verificar. E a última pergunta de curiosidade. Uhum. Tá? É, você, bom, depois, depois de você apresentar essa estrutura, uhum. é, você introduziu o conceito de homeostase. Uhum. Né? É da Hesinger? É? Não? É, ela um, é, pega o conceito do o estágio da uh, uh, Boyd, uh -huh. uh, mas o conceito de como estágio é muito antigo, antigo. Sim. Não lembro. Neste contexto, uh, é assim, eu lembrei da conversa que nós estávamos tendo no almoço sobre sim, a, o, sim. é isso, digamos assim, a tua intuição por trás é essa aí de usar, de ver no conceito de estágio a ideia de organismo do meio para é isso. Um, Sim, eh, todavia eh, tem outra questão eh, eh, aqui. Eh, eh, Hessinger eh, escreve que eh, é um, uma, uma chase dinâmica, uh -huh. eh, que todo o sistema é dinâmico e que, que po, pode eh, ajustar-se se a sociedade muda eh, também o sistema racista eh, pode, pode mudar. mudar. Mas não, eu não, não, não sou tão seguro que, que tem eh, esta dimensão dinâmica. Eh, porque eh, estes mecanismos Um, 
tal vez estos mecanismos eh, son eh, son una, una fuerte tendencia eh, a un, un sistema eh, racista eh. Eh, si, si tiene una cierta situación histórica, histórica eh, social Mas, eh, es, esta eh, dimensión dinámica no, no se circula Tal vez una tendencia es que la sociedad muda, esa tendencia se manifiesta en otras formas. Tal vez no es un sistema autorregulativo que inventan soluciones nuevas. En el caso del Hegel, él es autorregulativo. Sí, sí. Obrigado. Eu, eu tinha um, um. Vou pegar carona porque eu tinha umas duas questões que tem a ver com, com essa ideia. A primeira pergunta é exatamente isso, mas eu acho que você já respondeu. Ou seja, você acha que, tipo, sendo, sendo um equilíbrio é, homeostático hum. e. É, teleológico, a hum. minha questão é exatamente isso, ou seja, se hum. você não acha, usando a sua analogia da, da hidra de várias cabeças, né? hum. se, é, vamos dizer assim, combatendo propriedades específicas do equilíbrio hemostático, se, isso, se, se você acha que tem uma tendência a é, fazer surgir outras cabeças da, da besta, sabe? Hum. Se, 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 se você acha que essa é, é, é um, um, uma tendência desse tipo de, de equilíbrio, ou seja, se tem uma forma de autorregulação... Mas... Penso, penso. A autorregulação, autorregulação é, talvez é, precisa de algo mais, né? Se você tem. Ah, não, não. Ah, não. Não vai mais perder? Sim, mas não tem problema. Se você tem um. So, a container with water. There's a hole where the water is leaving and other water. Water is, is, is coming inside. Um, this is also homeostatic. Homeostatic uh, But now, now, uh, now, ten more structural teleological uh, creativity. Because uh, on the level of water, it remains the same even if something changes. In, por exemplo, more water gets inside, the more water flows out if, if it has the right form. But the stability is, is due to these mechanisms and due to the due to the openings in, in this case and yeah. the physical setup. If it has the right shape, then I would say here the causal mechanisms are something similar. They are more or less fixed. Você não precisa de uma de, de, yeah. de mm -hmm. e, e outra pergunta tem um pouco a ver com isso. Eu, 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 é, eu não li o texto do, do, do Minsa ainda, eu queria saber se essa analogia que ele faz entre... Seja, ele pega essa, esse, esse conceito de contrato racial, hum. se ele acha que há uma conexão entre é, contrato racial e surgimento do Estado-nação. Hum. Porque eu estava pensando, ou seja, se, 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 como se fossem duas coisas que vão de certa forma juntas e a metáfora que ele usa não é, é por acaso que ele usa a, a metáfora do contrato. Hum. É o momento do surgimento de um determinado tipo de formação política e se talvez isso não seja uma... É, um, uma maneira para tentar pensar uma saída do racismo, ou seja, na medida que... É... Hum. Uma pergunta muito interessante. Não, não me lembro alguma coisa que ele, 
Es gibt so viele Pisse. Es gibt so viele Pisse. Es so if, if you believe in the theory of this social contract, uh, contract it's, it's certainly tempting to make this question. Do you remember the state of the national or the choice of this? I've always been a metaphor in relation to the notion of the contract and the role. Yes, yes, but... Specifically, using the idea of the contract and the role. Sim, mas, mas ele acha, acha que, que este contrato é, é, é uma, uma realidade histórica é, que, que talvez é explicar também o Estado Nacional. Hum. Tem outras perguntas? Ah, eu tenho uma outra... Ah, não, não. É, historicamente falando, né, existe uma historicidade né, social, formação social, a gente vê que a gente adquire uma série de impressões né, indeléveis. Isso é guardado na gente, né, isso é passado fenomenologicamente, de geração, né, de geração. E aí eu trago um exemplo é, que eu vivenciei, antes de conhecer a filosofia, por exemplo, o pensamento platônico, né, que fala de aparência, essas minhas coisas. E aí, até umas décadas da Barbie, a boneca Barbie, ela tinha um, um padrão, né? Ela era branca, né? Magra, guia, olhos claros, azuis, é, e o cabelo louco. Né? E aí surgiu uma boneca chamada High Monster, né? e essa boneca é feia, né? dentro né, de, de, uma, de uma lógica, né? de uma lógica estrutural, não é delineada, ela é toda, totalmente avessa a esse belo que se construiu historicamente na nossa cabeça. Isso, naquela época, eu ainda era, né, quando se trabalhava, estava né, no auge, mas então. E aí, aqui no RN tem uma, uma, uma ação social a parte dos Correios, né? e, e junto com, com a prefeitura. Então, aí eu fui nos Correios, porque eu vi na televisão que faltavam três cartinhas para serem adotadas. É uma ação social. Você vai lá e lá tem uns presentes para dar para as crianças. E aí tinha essa boneca Raimonster, tinha mais dois presentes lá. E eu, naquela época, realmente, eu até porque também é muito caro, né? E eu não tive coragem de comprar a boneca, né? Mas eu vi realmente que é algo realmente desconexo, né? Até a mulher mesmo, a menina lá, a, a funcionária, né? ela disse, como é que pode um pai dar isso para a filha, né? para o filho, né? Sei lá. Isso aí me vem à mente o seguinte, esse cara... Ele não tem uma ideia simplesmente de construir uma boneca que, venha, que não venha atender uma demanda é, 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 mercadológica, entendeu? Né? Não ia construir uma boneca que não ia, entendeu? É, é alcançar né, um, né, um público, entendeu? E ia, ia ganhar dinheiro com aquilo, na verdade. Né? Então, o cara construiu isso para mim, esse cara tem uma, uma visão filosófica, na verdade. Né? E desconstruir uma, uma beleza, entendeu? Que estava naquela Barbie, né? E aí nós também já vimos que surgiram outras bonecas também, né? Como a Barbie aí, que está preta, né? Mais moreninha, né? De cabelos diferentes. E a gente vai vendo que é, 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 essa coisa né, do, do belo é, que é uma problemática, na verdade, também. Né? E aí vai se unir a, a questão da, da cor também. Porque se o negro ele não tem os caracteres de um, desse belo, delineado, desse, entendeu? ele já é considerado bonito, pode ver. Entendeu? Esse é magro, né? Então, então já existe, sabe, algo que já está sedimentado, que já está, entendeu? É, na nossa conjuntura, né? 
em si, entendeu? Ali já foi construído, e não faz se construir isso aí, mas vai já é, eu acho que centenas de anos, não vai ser tão simples assim, né? Até pela própria história da cidade do Negro, já é visto como um, como um algo que não é bom, não é legal, sei. Não é sei as pessoas, as pessoas não chamam um cara de negro, mas, pelo menos aqui, não sei nos Estados Unidos. É, mas aqui não chama, chama de morrendo, né? Entendeu? Porque existe isso. E ainda, para sobretudo, vem o tal do eufemismo, né? aquela figurinha de linguagem, que é para mandar os termos. Aí se cria o termo afrodescendente, ou seja, em vez de amenizar, está acentuando. Entendeu? Porque você não vai mais. Quanto mais, se você inventou uma palavra que é para amenizar aquele termo, entendeu? que é o afrodescendente, isso está dizendo o quê? Que aquela palavra é ofensiva. Aquela palavra, ela, ela causa desconforto, tá? Então, eu fiz mais ou menos um, um apanhado e eu queria saber qual é o seu posicionamento em relação a é, é, essa construção, entendeu? E, para se desfazer isso, é, 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 é quase impossível, na verdade. Tá, pessoal, obrigado. Vamos agradecer de novo o Franz aí para a palestra.